first thing I want to do in this video is to discuss summation notation. So we have a series here and we want first of all to consider the general term. Well the general term of this series is 2R. You see that if R is equal to 1 we get 2. If R is equal to 2 we get 2 2's or 4. When R is equal to 3 we get 2 3's or 6. So the general term TR is equal to 2R. Now, this symbol here that looks like an E is the Greek letter sigma. As a matter of fact, it's an uppercase or a capital sigma. Um, the lowercase sigma looks like this. This be a small sigma, a small letter sigma in the Greek alphabet. This is used to stand for standard deviation of a population in statistics. We won't be using that here. Here we have sigma from r equals 1 to 8 of 2r. What does that mean? Well, I'll just write it down here again. We start by looking at this expression here, and we replace r with this value, which is 1. So we get 2 times 1, which is 2. Then we increase r by one step. So we started off at r equals 1, so 2 corresponds to r equals 1. And we increase r by one step, so the next term is got by replacing r with 2. So we get 2 twos or 4. And we sum these terms, and so on. Then we look at the term for r equals 3. So we'll have 2 times 3 is 6. And we keep going until we get to r equals 8. So we'll have 2 times 8, which is 16. So this corresponds to r equals 8. Now, of course, since we're summing from r equals 1 up to r equals 8, we could write our series as t1 for the first term, plus t2 for the second term, plus t3 for the third term, and so on, up as far as t8 for the last term. But of course, t1 plus t2 up as far as t8 is also written S8 for the sum of the first eight terms. The last series we looked at was an arithmetic series. Now, let's look at this series here. We'll see that it's not arithmetic, and we'll also see that it's not geometric. Now, what we do is we start with this value here. It's not 1 in this case, it's actually 2. We plug 2 in for R, and we get 1 over 2 squared minus 1. So that's the first term. That actually corresponds not to r equals 1, but r equals 2. So that's t1, first term. To get the second term, we increase this value of r by 1. So we get r equals 3. So the second term is got by writing this out, replacing r with 3. So we get 1 over 3 squared minus 1. So that's t2. And to get t3, we just replace r with 4 now. So we get 1 over 4 squared minus 1. So that gives us t3 and so on. Until we get to this value of r. Now it's not a number, it's n. So we just write this out, replacing r with n. So that gives us the term well, actually, it's not Tn. You have to be careful here. This here actually corresponds to R equals N. But how many terms have we got? We don't have N terms, because R doesn't start at 1. It starts at 2. So we're going from R equals 2 up to R equals N. So we have N minus 1 terms. So this term is actually Tn minus 1. So we're adding t1 plus t2 plus t3 up as far as tn minus 1, where tr is 1 over r squared minus 1. Now, I've simplified down this series a bit. 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, 3 squared is 9, 9 minus 1 is 8, 4 squared is 16, 16 minus 1 is 15. Let's look at this series. It's not arithmetic, 
why is it not arithmetic? Well, if it was arithmetic, then if we calculate t2 minus t1, we should get the same answer when we calculate t3 minus t2. Calculating t2 minus t1 and t3 minus t2 gives us two different answers. So that means that this series is not arithmetic. So we only have to take two pairs of consecutive terms. So I took the first pair of consecutive terms, get the difference, and then I took the second pair of consecutive terms, I got that difference, and I get different answers. So it's not an arithmetic series. We don't have to do any more checking. If it's arithmetic, then the difference between two consecutive terms is always a constant. To see if the, to test the series, to see if it's geometric, um, or at least to prove that it's not geometric, we look at any term and divide it by the previous term. That gives us what's called a common ratio, R. It has to be the same for every pair of consecutive terms. So if we take T2 and divide by T1, we should get the same answer as 1 over 15 divided by 1 8 if it's geometric. If we do that, we have 1 8 divided by 1 third, multiply above and below by 3, that gives us 3 eighths. Over here we have 1 over 15 divided by 1 over 8, so multiply above and below by 8, that gives us 8 fifteenths. These two fractions are not equal. One way to show that is to multiply 3 by 15, which is 45, then multiply 8 by 8, which is 64. Um, 45 is not equal to 64, so these fractions are not equal, which means that this series is not geometric. Now it turns out that we can actually get a formula for this series in terms of n. If we write this general term, 1 over r squared minus 1, in terms of its partial fractions, what are its partial fractions? Well, we want to break this into two or more fractions. Um, for our purposes, we'll be breaking this into two fractions. So we'll be writing 1 over r squared minus 1 as two fractions. Now, the denominators of the two fractions will be factors of r squared minus 1. We can write r squared minus 1 as r minus 1 times r plus 1. You might recognize this thing here as the difference of two squares. Um, a squared minus b squared, in general, is can be written as a minus b times a plus b. So for our purposes, a is equal to r, b is equal to 1. So 1 here is like 1 squared when we're comparing to this, and we can get its factors. Now, we can break this single fraction into two partial fractions, um, where the denominators are the factors of r squared minus 1. Now, the question is, what are the numerators? We just call the numerators a and b. a and b are constants, they're fixed numbers, they don't depend on r. How do we find out what a and b are? Well, we just combine these two fractions and compare with this single fraction. Why, do, why are we doing all of this? Well, you will see later that if we write this in terms of its partial fractions and then do the summation, we will get something that has a pattern to it. And you will see that this thing reduces down considerably. It's not an arithmetic or geometric series, but it can still be managed. So let's find out what a and b are. So we combine these two fractions. Just add them together, get a common denominator. Just multiply the two denominators together. Then take the first denominator, divide it into the, the common denominator, and we get the other denominator, which is r plus 1, which we multiply by the numerator. Then we're adding. We take this denominator, divide into the common denominator, we get the other denominator, r minus 1, which we multiply by the numerator, which is b. So basically we multiply a by r plus 1 and b by r minus 1 and write that on top. Now that we've written the two partial fractions back into a single fraction, we can compare it with this single fraction. The only way two fractions can equal each other is if the numerators are equal. So 
the numerators must be equal. Well, the and the denominators must be equal. That's well, it's not the only way two fractions can be equal, but we already see that the denominators are equal. So to ensure that the two fractions are equal, we just have to put equate the denominators, or sorry, equate the numerators. The denominators are equal already, so the numerators must be equal to each other. So I'll have it written up here. We're equating the numerators. So we put r plus 1 times a plus r minus 1 times b equal to 1. Now, r is a variable. So r can take on any value. Well, it's actually any positive integer. r runs from 2 up to n. But a and b are fixed. a, b are, a and b are constants. So no matter what value we put in for r, this equation has to hold, because r is variable. As a matter of fact, we can put r equal to values that are not included here, from 2 to n. We could let r equal 1. Now, why would we let r equal 1? Well, if we do, we'll simplify this down a lot. If we put 1 in here, we get 2a. But when we put 1 in here, we get 0 times b, which is 0. So we end up getting 2a equals 1. So that forces a to equal a half. So a must equal a half. Um, now we can choose an, another value for r. So we pick a value for r that gets rid of either the a or b terms. That's the idea. So if we let r equal minus 1, then we have minus 1 plus 1 times a. That's 0 times a, plus, putting minus 1 in here, we get minus 1 minus 1, or minus 2b equals 1. So we get minus 2b equals 1, or b equals minus a half. So these are the values for a and b. So this is one way to find a and b. There is another way. The other way you can find a and b is to multiply out the left-hand side. So we get ar plus a plus br minus b equals 1. And then gather up the r terms. So we get a plus b times r. And then write down the terms that don't involve r. It's a and minus b, put them together. Now, since r is a variable, r can take on any value, and a and b are fixed, the only way we're going to ensure that we get plus 1 on the right-hand side is if what's inside the bracket is 0 because then we have 0 times r, so it doesn't matter what r is, because 0 times r is going to be 0. So this part, if a plus b is 0, we can forget about r, but then of course we want the rest of it to equal 1. So what we get is two equations. We get a plus b equals 0, which I'll write over here, and we have a minus b equals 1. So we have two equations and two unknowns, and we solved them. We can add the two equations together to get 2a equals 1, which leads us to a equals a half, as you saw before. And once we found a, then we just plug it into one of these equations, and we end up getting b equals minus a half. If we plug it into the top one, we have a half plus minus a half is 0. So those are two ways we can find a and b for the partial fraction expansion of 1 over r squared minus 1. So remember, 1 over r squared minus 1 was a over r minus 1 plus b over r plus 1, where a is a half and b is minus a half. So we've changed the form of our series. Another thing we can do is factor this half out of the top, and we can bring the half out to the very front. So we have sigma of 1 over r minus 1 minus 1 over r plus 1. If you want to see why we can pull a constant outside of, in front of the sigma, I'll just do a very simple example. Let's suppose we wanted to calculate this sum here, sigma r equals 1 to 4 of 3r. Well, we put 1 in for r, so we get 3 1s are 3. Then we put 2 in for r, 3 2s are 6. Then we put 3 in for r, 3 3s are 9. Then we put 4 in for r, that's the last value, 3 4s are 12. But you see, we can factorize 3 out of all of this here. This is just 3 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And we can write this as 3 times sigma of r 
where r runs from 1 up to 4. Okay, because this series here, you put 1 in for r, you get 1. Then you put 2 in for r, you get 2. You don't have to do anything to r, it just sits there. It's just r to the power of 1. Then you put 3 in, you get 3. Then you put 4 in, you get 4. So you end up with 3 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. So that shows that you can actually pull out a constant term, a constant factor, provided it's multiplied, of course. It can't be added to R. It has to be multiplied by R. Now, I'll continue in the next video. I'll explain how we actually can calculate this, how this thing actually turns out to simplify down greatly.